Romans chapter 5. We'll be reading from verses 6 to 8. Romans chapter 5. Paul writes, You see, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more should we be saved from God's wrath through him? It's come to me. Gracious and eternal God, <clears throat> we ask in your kindness that you send your Holy Spirit among us this morning in a very powerful and very wonderful way. Lord, may your Spirit touch every one of our hearts as he moves up and down the aisles and up in the pew. And Lord, may you open our eyes and open our understanding. May you impress these truths upon our lives. Help them to affect our lives this year. And help us to live more godly and in a way that is more honouring to you than ever before. For Jesus' sake. And God's people say to God's glory, Amen. Now last week in our New Year's message, we asked two questions. Firstly, what is the purpose of our lives? What is the purpose of our lives? And secondly, why are we here? And we saw from our study in Philippians chapter 1 that we are here for Jesus Christ. That we are here this new year to know Christ. To live for Christ. To die for Christ. As Paul writes in Philippians 1 verse 21, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now that is our purpose in living. And I do encourage you to listen to that message, uh, which will be posted, God willing, later this morning. Now this morning I want to continue with this theme, but I want to do so in a very practical way. Because I want to talk to you about how do we grow and develop in our relationship of knowing Jesus. How do we develop and grow in our relationship of knowing Jesus? I've been a Christian now for many, many years, and I want you to know that keeping fresh spiritually is something that I don't find easy. It's something that I have to work at in my own personal walk with God every single day. It's something that I struggle with even as a minister from time to time. And I don't think that I'm the only one. <clears throat> I think that if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know that you need to work and struggle in this whole area of keeping fresh spiritually before God. So that you don't grow stale and dry and dull in your walk with God. But you know what is so ironic? Is that as I moved into the study this week, I discovered that there is not much teaching on this in the modern church or even in Christian books for God's people. And so this morning I want to be very, very practical with you and talk to you about how do we keep our relationship with God fresh? How do we keep it exciting? How do we keep our relationship with God dynamic? How do you keep your walk with God as something that is growing and that it is developing? How do you keep it from not growing stale? Well, let's spend just a few minutes this morning looking at our basis of our relationship with God so that we get our basis right before we actually try to grow in it. So, that what is, so, so then, what is the basis of our relationship with God? Will you turn with me back to Romans chapter 5? Look at verses 6 to 8. <clears throat> now this is a well-known territory for many of us, but it's good to be reminded of what our basis actually is concerning our relationship and our personal friendship with God. Paul writes, Romans 5 verse 6 to 8. He says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still what? Powerless. Christ died for who? The ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man somebody might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now let's remember that when we talk about our relationship with God, the basis of that relationship is not our feelings. 
It's not how you and I feel. It's not our emotions. It's not visions and dreams. No. The basis of our relationship with God is the gospel. That is the basis of our relationship with God. That is the basis in which we relate to God in life. You see, friends, we must be very, very careful that we do not think that intimacy with God is something mystical. <coughs> that it's something that's otherworldly. I was looking at a certain book some weeks back called Celebration to Discipline. And it's amazing how mysticism and the New Age thought has crept into the modern church. So that there are all kinds of practices being propagated for Christians to actually draw closer to God. Such as, think about this, prayer visualization, believe it or not. Where the author says that as you pray, you need to imagine yourself rising up off the ground where you're at and going up into the clouds. Then you need to lean back in the clouds and you need to feel the clouds. Feel them around you. And then you need to imagine Jesus coming down out of heaven and standing in the cloud and then sitting down next to you so that you can then talk to him. <coughs> now that is complete and utter drivel and nonsense. God's word never ever teaches you about <coughs> that. Also in prayer, Christians are encouraged to empty their minds. Now again, God's word never teaches that. <coughs> God's word says, fill your mind. And then there are other practices that Christians are recommended so as to draw closer to God and to feel God more in their lives, such as repeating certain Christian words, almost like a mantra for 20 or 30 minutes. Just keep repeating the word, repeating the word, repeating the word, and so on. Now again, that is complete and utter nonsense. There is no such thing in the Bible. Our intimacy with God, yours and my relationship with God for the new year, starts with the Gospel. It starts with what God has gone and done for you and I, individually, in our own lives. And so the first question, look with me at Romans chapter 5, is what has Jesus done for us? Well, look at verse 6. It says very clearly, Christ died for the ungodly. Do you see that? Now that is not other people. That's not our enemies. It's not the government or Eskim, which you might be thinking. It's us. It's you and me individually. Now that is extraordinary, isn't it? If you know yourself like I know myself, I would not die for me. I wouldn't do that. But that is what Christ has done. He came into this world to die for people just like you and me. People who are ungodly at the very root of their own hearts. Look at verse 8. It answers the question, when did Christ die for us? Do you see a date there in verse 8? No, there's no date. But it does tell us when Christ died. It tells us that Christ died for us while we were still <coughs> sinners. And so God didn't look down from heaven and say, wow, there's some really wonderful, nice, good, godly, respectable people in Boxburg. I'm going to make them Christians. No, he died for the ungodly. He died for the undeserving. He died for sinners. Those who were his enemies, us. Now what is our response to, be, to, to the death of Jesus Christ this morning? Well, Paul tells us there, look at Romans 5 verse 1. He says, look at it. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, there is our response. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now justification, as you well know, means being declared right with God. Being declared not guilty before God. Peace with God, do you see that statement, peace with God there in verse 1? It's not speaking of a subjective peace, it's speaking of an objective peace in life. God has reconciled his enemies, sinners, us, to himself, he has made peace between his enemies, the object, you and I, and him. That's what he's done. <coughs> now what is our response to be to the death of Jesus Christ then? Look at Romans 5 verse 1. Faith. That is our response to God. For everything that he's done. Faith. 
We are justified, Romans chapter 5 verse 1, declared right with God through what? Faith. Not our own works. Not how much of the Bible we might know. Not the degrees that stand behind our name. Not our own good works and efforts in daily life, no. Instead, the only way that you and I can be justified with God, to be <coughs> reconciled to God, is by faith, trusting in Him, trusting in what Jesus Christ has gone and done for you and I. Not what we do. But it's what Christ has gone and done. In 1915, an event occurred called the Trans. And Arctic Endurance Expedition. Considered by many to be the last major expedition in the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. Conceived of by Sir Ernest Shackleton, you've probably heard of it. And it became an epic story and feat of endurance. And that what happened in the Antarctic on the way to the Pole is that their ship, the Endurance, which they recently found by the way, became trapped in the ice. For the entire winter of 1915, eventually the ship was crushed by the ice pack and it sank, stranding 28 men on the ice. And those men were to spend months in makeshift camps on floating ice packs, one after the other. Eventually, they used their lifeboats to sail to the inhospitable, uninhabited Elephantine Island. When they turned their boats upside down, they built a shelter there, and there they stayed for literally months surviving. While their captain, Ernest Shackleton, and five members of the crew made a 1,300 kilometer or 800 mile open boat journey in a lifeboat to South Georgia for help. What those 28 men went and endured is absolutely incredible. In that to the degree that they could solve their day-to-day -day problems, literally month after month after month after month, on a barren, bleak ice camp. But none of that mattered if they could not be rescued. No matter what they went and did for themselves, they couldn't fix the real problem in their lives. It had to come from the outside to them. They needed to be rescued. Now that is a brilliant picture of what God has done for us. We cannot rescue ourselves. We can do all kinds of things as human beings in our own daily life. We can go to the moon. We can send probes to Mars. We can build laptops and iPads and e-phones. We can even make electric motor cars. We can create what we like. We can invent what we want to invent. But there is one thing that we cannot do. We cannot rescue ourselves. We are literally stranded on the pack ice of our own sinfulness and our own wickedness and our brokenness every day of our lives. <coughs> we cannot fix the biggest issue in our life, which is yours and my relationship with Jesus Christ. We are literally shipwrecked on the ice of life. And that is what Romans chapter 5 verse 8 is all about. Jesus is on God's rescue mission. He has come to rescue us from our sinfulness, from ourselves, and from the wrath of God Himself. And faith is about you and I rising up and literally trusting Jesus Christ to do that for you and I in daily life. And so when we sit back this morning, when we talk about intimacy with God, when we talk about a relationship with God, it has absolutely nothing to do with yours and my emotions in daily life. It has nothing to do with strange and mystical experiences which might affect us. Or weird things that some, some minister <coughs> or church recommends in one's prayer life. But it has absolutely everything to do with what Jesus Christ has gone and done for us. He died for us. He justified us. He rescued us. He adopted you and I into His family. And that is the basis of our relationship with God. Just one thing I need to say on this. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Romans 8, verse 1. 
Paul writes, great here, Bible pages, Paul writes, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life, that's the Holy Spirit, set me free from the law of sin and death. Wow. Now when you put your faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation, you are somebody today here who received the Holy Spirit of God into your life. Do you know that? <coughs> you don't just believe in what God has done just because you believe it. You don't just turn and put your faith in God because you suddenly put your faith in God. You don't do that. You are somebody who believes by faith because you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God to do so. Your faith in God, your trust in God for salvation this morning is an act of God in your life. Your belief is an act of a working God in your life. You cannot be a Christian here this morning and not have the Holy Spirit of God in you. That is a contradiction in terms. As Paul says, look at Romans chapter 8 verse 9. <clears throat> he says, you however are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if, watch this, anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, he does not belong to Christ. In other words, you cannot be a Christian, you cannot come to salvation, if you have not been born again, if God's Spirit has not been given to you. That is what Paul is saying. That when you put your faith in Christ, God supernaturally turns and places His Spirit within you at that point in your life. Now that is not something necessarily that you might feel. It's not as though you're going to feel a bright light and a flash and the ground is going to shake and strange things happen. But there will be changes that will take place in your life because of it. There will be new loves and new hates. So that there will be things that you hate, <coughs> which you didn't hate before. You will hate sin. You will hate evil. You will hate it when you sin yourself. You will hate things like injustice. That will be the mark of somebody who has received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. There will also be things that you personally love. You will love the Lord Jesus Christ. Now for a moment, just think back to the point when before you knew Christ, before you became a Christian, before you stood up and you made that confession that Jesus is your Savior. Think back to that time. You hated talking about Jesus, isn't that so? People would sit back and they would talk about God and that was fine. People could sit back and talk about the church and that was fine. But don't sit back and talk about Jesus to me. But when you became a Christian, things suddenly changed. You love to talk about Jesus. You love to talk about God's Word, the Bible, and what God's Word has, and what you found in God's Word. And you love to pray. You love sitting back and meeting with the people of God in daily life. A change has taken place in your life. Now very, very practically, let's pick up on three principles as to how we can keep that new relationship with God fresh, and new and dynamic for the new year. And therefore, be somebody here today who has a greater intimacy with God. Are you ready for this? Three principles. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 24. Principle number one. There needs to be regular Sunday worship. There needs to be regular Sunday worship in our lives. Now I know that we worship God 24-7, we worship God in everything we do from the moment we get up in the morning to the time that we go to bed at night, but God's Word tells us that one of the keys for spiritual freshness in our walk with God is regular Sunday worship. Meeting with God's people on a regular basis. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 and 25. The writer says, and let us consider how we, we may what? Spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let's not give up what? Meeting together. 
as some in the habit of doing, but let us what? Encourage one another all the more <coughs> as you see the day approaching. Now as we look at those verses, it's patently obvious that the New Testament, there is no such thing as a Lone Ranger type Christian. In that you don't walk the Christian walk alone with God. You don't do that. The New Testament rather understands Christian growth as something that takes place corporately. Corporately. There is no such thing as Robinson Crusoe type Christians in the Bible, no. We need each other. We need to be part of a family, a community. Look at Hebrews 10 verse 24. <coughs> it says, Spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Hebrews 10 verse 25. Let us not give up meeting together as some in the habit of doing, but let us what? Encourage one another. Now it's kind of obvious there as we look at the year ahead that you cannot meet together on your own. Did you notice that? We cannot encourage one another on our own. You cannot love one another and show that love to one another on your own. All things happen within a community. Christian growth in our lives before God happens corporately. We are part of a family, every single one of us. We're not loners, not even in heaven. And as you see, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, it's very difficult to spur one another on towards love and good deeds when you don't meet together. We need to meet together as a family and as the people of God so that we can hear God's word, so that we can encourage one another, so that we can be faithful to Jesus for another week. We need to encourage one another to do that. Some of you live in homes where there are no other Christians in the home. You are the only Christian there. It's tough, isn't it? You know it better than I do. Some of you are in schools where you're the only Christian there. Some of you are at work where you feel that you're the only Christian in that entire office. And there are no other Christians there. Now that's tough going. Because your language, your values, your behavior, your attitudes are totally different to those people who may be around you. And that is why it is so crucial that we continue to meet together to encourage one another to be faithful to Jesus Christ literally for another week. We're in a church family. There's no opposition here. We can live the talk and walk the walk. And everyone does it. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 and 25. God has called us together to spur one another on to love and to good deeds and to encouragement and the hearing of God's word. Now I'm sure that I'm not talking about anyone here this morning. But there are those who do come regularly to the church. Like clockwork at Easter and Christmas. I know that because I shake their hand at Easter and Christmas. And that is why they do not grow in their Christian faith. And other Christians are streaking ahead of them throughout the year, continually growing in their knowledge of Christ. Christian growth, you see, is a corporate activity. It doesn't happen individually. We need each other to grow closer to Jesus Christ and to be encouraged. I encourage you, and you encourage me. Secondly, we not only need to meet together, but we need to be ruthless about sin. We've got to be ruthless about sin. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. The author says, Therefore, since we are surrounded <coughs> by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, and what? The sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on who? Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Wow. And so the author of Hebrews tells us that it is sin which hinders our walk with God. It's sin, Hebrews 12 verse 1, which hinders us. It damages our relationship with Jesus Christ. <coughs> and it prevents you and I from living and walking the Christian walk as we should. Effectively. 
It is not, listen carefully, that sin changes God's love to you. For God's love for you as His children is something, when you are justified and saved through faith, that is constant. God's love does not change to you. And if you're a parent sitting here this morning, you are somebody who knows that, don't you? Your love for your children, even though they blow it and they hurt you, is something that doesn't fail. You don't give up on your love for your child. Your love for them does not change. It remains constant as a parent no matter what your child has gone and done. And that is the same with Jesus. When Christ died on the cross, He died for all our sins, past, present, and future, all of them. And so my sins don't change God's love for me. What my sins do is that they change my experience of God's love to me. Do you see that? That's the problem. So that our sin hinders you and I personally experiencing God's love and forgiveness in our lives as we should. Turn with me to Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4. <coughs> Psalm 32, verse 3 and 4. The Psalm of David. Psalm 32. Now David was a man who knew God's love. In fact, God turns around in the Bible and he says David was a man after his own heart. And yet at some point in David's life, there was unconfessed, unrepentant sin. Look at Psalm 32, verse 3 and 4. And it made David feel miserable. He says, verse 3 and 4 of sin, <coughs> When I kept silent, my bones wasted away, through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. Your strength, my strength was set as in the heat of summer. Now that is the mark of someone who is a Christian, who is living with unconfessed, unrepentant sin in their own lives. They feel miserable. They feel wasted. They feel washed up. They feel tired by it. Isn't that true? When you've got sin in your life, you just feel utterly drained. It just pulls you down, drags you down. When you know the Lord and there is sin in your life, you are miserable. You can be happy for a while as a non-Christian. You can be happy as a Christian, but you cannot be happy as a Christian living as a non-Christian. You will be miserable in life. And that is what David is saying here. It wasn't that God's love for David had gone and changed, or that David suddenly wasn't a Christian anymore because he had gone and sinned in his life against God. What changed was his experience of God's love because of his own sin. And so what does David go do? He repents. He turns and he calls upon God for forgiveness in his life. Psalm 32 verse 5. And he says this, When I acknowledged my sin, do you see that? To you, and did not cover up my iniquity, I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. You forgave the guilt of my sin. Because he repented, he knew God's forgiveness to him. Look at Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2. The relief of forgiveness in his life. It just came flooding back to him. He says, Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed, happy is the man whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed, happy is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. Wow. Let me make two comments about sin just very, very quickly here. Firstly, sin, when sin touches our lives, what changes our experience of God's love starts with a lapse into sin. In that you commit a sin, whatever that sin is in life. Now the spiritual damage <coughs> would be relatively minor if we went straight to God immediately after doing it and said, Lord, I have failed you again. Please forgive me in my life. But that often doesn't happen, does it? Let's be honest. What happens though is the devil comes along and he says, Mark, you're a failure. You've gone and blown it again before God. You can't even keep your promises and your word to God. Didn't you say you're not going to sin again? Look what you've gone and done. You're just going to fail again. You might as well just give up. Just give up. Stop being a Christian. 
You're not a Christian. There are people out there who are far better than you are in life. Look at you. That's what he whispers in my I don't know what he whispers in yours. Now, if you believe that lie, then you as a Christian start to become despondent. And one sin leads to a second sin, which leads to a third sin, and it continues. And you become more and more miserable to approach God. It's a kind of vicious circle all the way down, isn't it? The warmth of that relationship with God is gone. And the longer it continues, the more miserable you become in your life. And people start to notice the nattiness. Until you do what David did and you become clean with God. And this leads me to make a quick second point here. And that is when it comes to sin, you need to identify your Achilles heel in life as a Christian. We all have an Achilles heel. Certain sins that we are more vulnerable to than others and we are all different. What affects you does not affect somebody else necessarily. And especially when we are tired, stressed, lonely, or depressed. Haven't you found that in your life? That when you're tired and you're stressed and you're lonely and you're depressed, you're more open to sinning and falling before God? And so we need to be especially alert at those times in our lives. Maybe it's certain people that we shouldn't see. Discussions that we shouldn't get into. Certain films that we shouldn't watch. Maybe it's the internet. Certain thought patterns that we should not entertain, but at the moment <coughs> we open those thoughts up, it drags us down. But we need to be ruthless with whatever that sin is that affects us in daily life. In Mark 9.43, Jesus put it up this way. He said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than have two hands and go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, it's better for you to enter life crippled than have two feet and go into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than have two eyes and be thrown to hell. Now Jesus is not saying they go and chop off hands and feet and gouge our eyes. We'd be blind and crippled all around our time. <laughs> but what he is saying is that where there is sin in your life, Radical surgery may be needed to get rid of it in your life. Cut it off. If it's a person, cut them out. If it's an issue in your life, a thought pattern, get rid of it. Stay away from it. And then the third principle to keep our relationship fresh with God this year, <coughs> and very quickly, then I'm going to just start closing with this, is this. If you are going to have a dynamic walk with God, you need to get into the Bible. You need to get into Scripture. For God primarily speaks to you and I, not through flashes of light, necessarily <coughs> dreams, but He speaks to you and I through the Bible. Now, every day, you and I are bombarded by the media. We're bombarded by advertising, by WhatsApp, by Facebook. You go to the office and you've got a hundred and something emails sitting there waiting for you. And all day we are bombarded by the email and most often it's godless and it is secular. But what is going to influence your mind for God? The Bible. It's not a magical, mystical book. But it does change one's thinking and one's values as the Spirit of God uses God's Word to change and spiritually direct your heart and life to make you as a person more like Jesus Christ and to keep you from sin. D.L. Moody, the great Baptist preacher of the 19th century, wrote this in the fly leaf of his Bible. He said, this book will keep you from sin. Or sin will keep you from this book. That's right, isn't it? Now, in our world today, I think we need to be very creative on this in terms of the Bible. In that instead of listening to the radio, <coughs> tuning into 702, click on an app and listen to the Bible being read to you. Nothing is better than Scripture. Download sermons. Listen to quality preaching and grow in your Christian faith as you do so. And watch your life change. And in all this, pray. Pray, pray, pray. Speak to God continually. Build your relationship with God. Talk to God about everything this new year. Absolutely everything. From the smallest thing in your life to the most concerning thing in your life. Everything. 
In fact, do you know the book of Acts in the Bible? The book of Acts? When you pray, think of the word Acts. A stands for adoration. In other words, praise God in your prayer. C is confessing your sins. <coughs> T is to thank God. And S is for supplication. Present to God your needs and your requests. Acts is a key to prayer. My prayer is that you would grow and develop in your relationship with Jesus Christ this year. May you do so. And may God bless you as you seek Him. Let's come to prayer. Perhaps God has spoken into your heart this morning. Maybe there's things that you know you need to do, standing against sin, committing yourself to scripture, committing yourself to church attendance, to fellowshipping with God's people. Maybe it's something else that God's touched your heart with. Why don't you just speak to the Lord about growing for Christ this year? Gracious and eternal God, we know that as we look to this year that lies ahead, one of the greatest things that lies before us is a living, dynamic, growing relationship with you as God. That we're not born into this world to just exist, to get up and just sort of flounder through the day and go to bed at night, and get up and flounder through the day. But we're here to have a dynamic, living, exciting, personal relationship with the King of the universe. And Lord, although we've touched on some very simple points this morning, may you help each and every one of us this year to grow in Jesus Christ. To live a dynamic and wonderful life for God. So that at the end of this year, we can stand before you and say, Lord, you know I've tried. And Lord, my life has changed for Jesus. Help us, Lord, for Jesus' sake. And God's people say in Christ, Amen. Amen.